All right. So some of our world's leading scientists have claimed that in a dozen years from now, like we'll be able to, we have to keep global warming temperatures up to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Beyond which, even half a degree Celsius of increase would actually worsen the risk of floods, droughts, and other extreme weather patterns. We are also witnessing a scenario, like perhaps in, in mankind history, where we had one of the worst plastic pollutions. Our marine animals are dying, and microplastics have found its way into our food chain. If we don't act now, by 2050, we would have more plastics than fish. We are so involved in things like deforestation. We are cutting down the forests for the sake of development. And all of this worries me, Nadia. It, it worries me, it, it worries our future generations who are going to be inheriting this earth. You, Nadia, as the UN Goodview Ambassador uh, for, for the Environment, have been an inspiration to us all. Like, perhaps you could share with us a little bit about how, what got you started on that journey. Uh, okay, thank you so much for uh, asking and thank you everyone for turning up. Um, I started speaking about environmental issues in the uh, 90s, actually. Uh, and the reason that I, I started on this journey is, is because I was a young mum. So I don't know if anybody heard my talk yesterday. Am I repeating myself? Yeah. Okay, so, so I, I will repeat myself a little bit. So um, uh, I first got my diving license around 26, 27 years ago. And uh, I was absolutely petrified of what I could see under the sea. You know, all of those things under there were like really scary. These shadows, they were monsters and aliens and all this kind of stuff. So I really hesitated to get my diving license. And when I first did my first uh, dive off the boat, I was holding on to my dive buddy and I was crying in my mask and I couldn't let go. And I was like, oh my God, everything's going to get me, you know. Uh, and then my second dive, I was like, you know what, forget this. I have to get up close and personal and really try to understand what these things are and they're not out to get me. So I got really close to all of the coral and all of the fish and that was it, you know. Then you couldn't get me out of the water. Uh, not long after that, I had my first child. Uh, he's uh, 25 now. And uh, shortly after that, then I went diving again in the same place, uh, about a year and a half, two years apart. And at that time when I went diving again, all of the colors were gone. The coral was broken. The fish were in fish traps. And at that time already then, there was already plastic floating on the ocean. And it just hit me so hard. And I thought, my goodness, if in my lifetime, my world has changed so much. How about in the lifetime of my child? Uh, and so that's, ha that's how I got started. I mean, aside from the fact that my mom was uh, a greenie and she talked about being self-sustainable, living off the grid, and she also rescued orangutans before I was born. My mom's Australian, my dad's Indonesian. So I kind of grew up with these things planted in my mental continuum from a very young age. But once I was a parent, I realized that if I didn't do whatever I could in my very limited capacity, I'm not a scientist. I left school when I was 12. So I just had to do whatever I could, right? And then in my, uh, in my 20s, uh, uh, I was blessed with a platform that was a regional platform on television across Southeast Asia, and, uh, which was MTV. Uh, so I was one of the pioneering VJs that launched the MTV channel. And we were kind of left to be free to talk about whatever we wanted. And it was usually crazy stuff, but I realized that Aside from the intro and the outro, what I wanted to do was talk about issues that I cared about. And they were very basic then. It was International Year of the Ocean, Reduce, Reuse, Recycle, talking about orangutans. But then that started to come back to me. It was being echoed back to me by the audience. And it was from then on that I used the platform that I've been blessed with to talk about issues that I thought were really important. So that's how I got on this journey. It was a very lonely space. So welcome to the party. It's not such, I'm not just the crazy lady sitting in the corner talking about things that people <laughs> should, should be uh, 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 thinking about. So now it, it is thankfully a little bit noisier in this space. Yeah, so, so you've been involved in eco-activism even before it became a thing, like since the early 1990s, I, yes. I believe. How has that changed over the years, like up, up to now? Well, you know, obviously in the last um, couple of years, it's become a lot noisier, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, now we have a lot more of the younger generation who are incredibly switched on 
Mm -hmm. Incredibly, incredibly switched on, and um, they are shifting the dial. And I think they should be invited to not only engage in discussion, but also be involved in decision-making processes because we're making decisions and decisions yeah. for them yeah. on their behalf. So it's yeah. crazy that they're not more involved. Right, right. So, so one of the conversations that I was having with a friend like recently, well, what she said was a lot of people tend to identify more with social issues because they can see the direct impact of it. But when you talk about environmental impacts, sometimes it's just, you know, it just goes past your mind. It's almost as though we're having a dialogue that's 30,000 feet above ground. Like, how do we make it real for people? I mean, just, just in your role as an eco-activist, like, what are some of the strategies that work and, and what doesn't? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> I think what we need to do is have this sort of multidisciplinary dialogue of people from very diverse backgrounds and engage behavioral change scientists and uh, guys from technology and, and so that we can, can move, the, move the dial. Um, environmentalists and scientists have been talking about these issues for a very long time and the truth is unfortunately uh, from uh, hailing back as far as the, you know, the days of, of the original hippies up until now, we haven't actually made a dent. Uh, and that's a sad reality. Uh, but I do think with um, the onset of engagement and uh, engaging with technology, I think there's a lot of potential for us to shift things a lot faster. So you mentioned something about not making a dent. Like, do you think that there's a disconnect between different stakeholders in terms of communicating you know, like on environmentalism? Like, is there a difference between how academicians do it versus, you know, someone in the public figure like yourself? Yeah. Like, I, what, I mean, what, what's the problem here? Yeah, there is a, there is a communication breakdown. I think um, having great minds in, um, in storytelling, in uh, media, in uh, the creative world to come together with the world's top scientists could be some of the best ways that we could move forward. You know, I was just at the United Nations Environment Assembly where we launched the GO6, which is the Global Environment Outlook. Uh, and that, that is a document that's like an old phone book. I'm, I'm sure some of you still remember phone books. They were like huge, they were doorstops, right? So, and these are some of the world's top scientists working on these documents that get, that get presented and there's so much information in there. But, how do people understand that? How do we get those messages, those critical messages, messages out there uh, so that it hits home? And how do we, um, and, and these are challenges, I'm putting it out there because we haven't, clearly haven't we figured haven't it out figured yet, right? So how do we, how do we um, uh, really show the interconnectedness of things that really link back to individuals' lives uh, that show the impact? in their life directly. And mm -hmm. as more and more people live in cities, yeah. uh, and more and more people are disconnected to nature, yeah. and disconnected from each other, other even, yeah. right? It, it makes it increasingly more difficult. Because yeah. yeah. they're constantly on their mobile phones yeah. and plug into the internet. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're yeah. so disconnected. All right. Speaking about individuals, like I actually did a quick survey with the Global Shapers community. Yeah. And the two top environmental issues that came up was the climate crisis and the whole issue around plastic pollution yes. pertaining to the way that we consume, you know, overconsumption and greed. How should we be managing these two issues? I think for, uh, for the generation who have concerns about these things, and I, I was mentioning this earlier, was, is that um, it's wonderful to stand up and, and, and try to uh, encourage or request for change, uh, or push for change, or with the climate strikes and all of these things that are happening. But uh, what that, that is, that's great, because it is actually making a dent. And just, just so you know, how many people are familiar with Greta Thunberg? <laughs> we are roughly, okay, but about half of the, the audience. So Greta is a, is a young climate activist, and she has been the one who's instigating these climate strikes uh, with school children across the world. And Greta, um, because she, she, she made a comment about uh, 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 aviation emissions, and that has sparked now flight shaming uh, in, in Sweden. So the airlines have actually uh, experienced a 10% drop in 
flying in business in the last six months. So there is, there is impact in the younger generation or any individual raising their voice and concern about what's happening in the planet. But the next thing that needs to happen is that you arm yourself with an incredible toolkit, mm. right? That toolkit, you know, involves, you know, includes uh, understanding of policy, yep. right? Which I don't have, actually. Yeah. I wish I did. Um, and uh, and uh, great storytelling abilities, uh, an ability to network, an ability to speak and listen outside your own circles, engage with people who, uh, technology, for example, yeah. AI tech yeah. and science, you know, yeah. they, these are the most exciting people to me yeah. uh, because they're waiting. They're waiting for the challenges. They don't yeah. have the solutions in hand, but if you go to them and say, hey, I have this problem, they're like, okay, here's the solution for you. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. They're the guys who are really, you know, based on solutions and finding and finding solutions. So that's, that's my recommendation. Don't just get out there with placards and, and sort of say, hey, I'm angry and we need yeah. to change the world. But, yeah. you know, really arm yourself with a great toolkit. Great, yeah. So, so it seems that, you know, like we are, we are, we always say that we are the first generation to acknowledge the fact that we are destroying the planet. And you're probably the last that could do anything about it. And yes, as you've rightly mentioned, yeah. millennials and youth, the younger people, like, are really stepping up their game. Yeah. So in the Global Shapers community, for example, like, um, we have actually committed to wanting to address uh, the climate crisis. And also people like Greta Thunberg, like, she's inspired a whole movement on discourse rights for, for climate, right? Um, apart from equipping ourselves with tools, like, yeah. you know, what other advice would you give to, you know, this group of really passionate uh, and, and, and hungry driven, uh, you know, millennials who are just out there wanting to champion uh, their, their cause? Um, <laughs> don't give up is the first thing. It's very easy to get, um, to get fatigued, um, you know, it's very easy to, once one door closes, then you sort of say, oh, I've no, I've no, there's no hope, I'm not going to be able to do this, you know. But, but sort of, I guess, I guess what's really important is to surround yourself, build, build a community, identify, identify who it is that, within your community uh, and with the great, within the greater community who has the same feelings. Bring those people together. Create uh, uh, an organization of you together. Together you have a more powerful voice and you have a, uh, a network of people with different skill sets. Um, and yeah, I think the most important thing is don't give up. I mean, I've been doing this since for so long. Yeah. Right, and, yeah. and in all honesty, I think it's because I am an optimist. It's interesting to hear about the optimist-pessimist thing that you were talking about earlier. Mm. Um, but in, in all honesty, in the last um, six months or so, I have actually been quite depressed mm. uh, by some of the numbers uh, and statistics and some of the books that I'm reading. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do believe with technology, we may be able to come up with some of the great challenges or, or, or... So there's still hope, literally. There is still hope. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, 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 I would like to think so. I think that, you know, humans are good at heart. You know, I don't believe that anyone is 100% bad. And I do believe that everybody wants to make a difference. And perhaps if we could come up with a checklist or a playbook to enable people uh, in whatever fields they're in, whether they're in science, whether they're in, in marketing, whether they're lawyers, whether they're in HR, you know, mm. what, whatever you do, you, you can be in a position of influence and create yeah. impact. So it's really a matter of playing to their strengths, depending yeah. on where, where, where they are in yes. life. Okay. okay. So, so in this room, like, we probably have some of the world's most powerful like, or top corporate executives who are also policy makers and decision makers in their own right. Uh, but then there are, some of them are also parents, like whose children will actually be inheriting the earth. Um, how do we breach that intergenerational you know, like gap or divide in terms of having conversations about what we need to do for, for the environment? Yeah, I, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, I think the most important thing is that we are engaging with the younger generation. Um, I do feel that they are a lot more in tune with what's going on. They are, you know, there's also a huge level of eco-anxiety, uh, I think, for um, the younger generation, and we need to acknowledge that uh, and be very mindful of that. Um, I guess it really does come back to what I said earlier, is to, to really be looking to them for answers. Right. You know, it, it is kind of, we've had this kind of, 
hierarchical kind of attitude about things and saying, well, we know best and you guys follow our footsteps. But I honestly don't think that that is the case anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so if we can turn to the younger generation to, mm -hmm. to really look for solutions or work with them and support them mm -hmm. or, or, you know, yeah. in, in whatever skill sets yeah. that we may have, but to, to acknowledge that they may have more answers than we do. Okay. No, I thought that's quite an interesting perspective that you've brought out because in my experience, um, I'm often told that you know, you're either too young or too inexperienced to actually have an opinion. And how do you think I should be responding to, this, to an adult or, or someone more mature who says that you know, we just don't have much to offer? Like in, in this? Uh, persistence. Um, oh. I don't know. How do you approach somebody with a mind that's not open, right? You, yeah. it's, 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 that, is, that is a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess for me, what it is, is when I've hit a door that doesn't open, then I will just continue to find other avenues, right? Uh, and, and just not give up. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Conti just, just, just don't, yeah, just don't give up. And, yeah. you know, maybe, okay, there's, there's a wall, okay, maybe I, I can't, I need, I need to figure out, do I go around it this way, this way, do I climb over it, do I go under it, just, you know, look for other, other ways to approach it. Right, okay. And, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, what, what are your hopes and aspirations for, you know, the, the younger generation, like, say, in the next five or to ten years, like, what do you hope to see or... Mm. I hope that the younger generation can be supported in terms of their emotional well-being. I do think that um, we are we're, we are moving in a world which has will have increased uh, levels of fragility uh, in the climate and in the communities. So for the younger generation, I think what's really important is that we, we shift the, the discussion not only to be discussing climate change and uh, the issues that our planet has, but also how we can rebuild that sense of community and connection because that is something that will be able to tide us through in many ways when we look at whole human issues and we can help to build resilience and empathy and compassion uh, and, and reconnecting to, to the human spirit uh, because it's very difficult, I believe, to get, um, get someone to care about elephants or orangutans or the ocean or uh, climate change if they don't care about themselves first and foremost. If they don't care about themselves, then why are they going to even give a shit, excuse my language, about what's going on with the planet, yeah. right? And it, they, need to, they need to care about their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their fathers. So we need to... Uh, look at how we can rebuild those, that sense of community and compassion. Uh, uh, and I do hope, I do sincerely hope that there are ways that we can do that, uh, to nurture that in, in the generation that's, yeah. that's coming in this world that is facing the challenges the that, challenges they, yeah, that, that, that yeah, we have that left that behind, that I, we like yeah. have left behind for them. Yeah, yeah. sounds great. Yeah. And, and maybe from your side, maybe you could give some feedback, also an interesting point of view from, from where you stand uh, yeah. for, uh, for the generation who has come before you, who has left this huge... Uh, um, Environmental burden. Like, disaster, <laughs> disaster for you, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think the younger generation are those who are, you know, like we are definitely very hungry, like so we are very passionate about our cause. But what we do need from, you know, like, people like yourselves, I suppose, it's really a platform like, for our voices to be heard. So we want to have a sit on the table to make sure that you, know, you hear some of our suggestions and also to pave the way for potential networks, networking and collaboration. So we spoke a lot about you know, wanting to build a community, but you know, like, we cannot you know, like, save the planet if we were to do this in isolation. We need everyone on board. So right? what's missing? I think opportunities, mm. if I have to summarize it in, in a nutshell. I think there just needs to be more platforms for yeah, younger people to just voice out what they're concerned about and to be part of the, the solution. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah. How do you see that forming? Um, well, if, well, what, yeah. what, what, if you had, if you had like, mm. you know. A wish list. Yeah, a wish list. Okay, what are your, what are your top three or five wishes? Well, I mean, I think firstly, I think through the Global Shapers community, I think there's a lot of opportunities that, that we can leverage on, like perhaps to work with the YGLs, 
uh, the Young Global Leaders Network to see if we can actually come up with, um, I suppose, an environmental program. I mean, in fact, we have actually just launched the uh, Voice for the Planet uh, campaign where people can actually sign up to like, and pledge your commitments to make uh, the planet a better place to live in. So if, how, how many of you have actually heard of Voice for the Planet? <laughs> oh, okay, like, that's not a lot. But hopefully at the end of this, like, we'll get all of you to sign up and make pledges accordingly. Can, I, I, can yeah. I ask, what does a pledge actually equal? In, 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 in reality, what does it equal? Uh, com commitments. So it's sort of a checklist that, that talks about some of the things that, that you can do like as an individual. Mm -hmm. Like, so it talks about lifestyle changes, like if you were traveling, for example, like, you know, like you can make a commitment to carpool or take, you know, public transportation at least, mm -hmm. or to try being a vegan, like at least two to three times in, in a week. So it's not necessarily like huge steps that you have to make. They're sort of incremental, small baby steps that you can sort of commit yourselves to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And, and I think with that, like, we should uh, open up for questions like, from the floor. Uh, maybe we'll take three, and then we can direct it to another. Yeah. Okay, were well, you talking about just that? Um, mm. yeah. So you're just talking there about flagship commitments, which I agree with yeah. entirely. But I think one of the issues is that it's often made to, the individuals are often made to feel very responsible, where they do bear responsibility, obviously. But when we're here, like at the World Economic Forum, for example, which is extremely influential, should it not be for them really to lead the way in practical steps? For example, I was very shocked by the amount of plastic that is here, by the fact that we all have to fly very far to be able to partake in a really very exciting forum. I know people can watch it online, but should it not be for young global shapers like yourselves to try and influence those decision makers to make a difference at their level and that can trickle down uh, top down as well as bottom up? Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, that was very valid. We'll, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll take three questions, so then we'll yeah, answer. Yeah. Great, thank you very much for your work. I think it's amazing and I think that you're capitalizing on the fact that people are powerful and if many people in the world believe in something, then they can make things happen and you've used your platform to do so. But the question I have as a young scientist is with the methods of trying to tell people that these are things they should do because they should, that way of communicating is dangerous because another influencer can say the exact opposite and Nobody knows exactly what to believe. So as a scientist, what I was wondering is to what degree do you think that a public personality like yourself could try to convince everyone that they should try to think and reason and become scientists and mathematicians of their own? Because then the entire world of 7 billion people could be very reasonable and actually all come to a conclusion instead of them believing different people that they prefer to believe. Okay, and I think there was a question at the back. Are you going to remember them? Um, I'm, I'm actually joking. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. Joking. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm Jack Sim. I'm the founder of the World Toilet Organization. Hi. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, I think that when they do something, they do little things like, oh, we don't, we don't uh, we use straw anymore, but we will still use the water bottle. So, I don't understand. If they don't use straw, why do they use the water bottle? So I went to the hotel and I say, hey, hotel, you don't use straw. Why do you still use the water bottle? They say, ah, you know, it's business. So this kind of problem, how do you solve? You, you go to the guy, almost they're like hypocrites, right? Yeah. If all the hotels start to use glass flasks, which we used long ago, then they would have already led. But then they say, oh, we did the straw. So how do you solve this kind of commercial thing? Then if you talk about like flights. Indonesia is going to build 100 airports. Of course, you're going to fly a lot. And this. So the car manufacturing industry, so are we real or are we just pretending? This is the question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, like, Nadia, would you like to address the first two questions? Okay, the first okay. question yeah. was how do we get science uh, how do you get younger people into, you know, like influencing decisions that, that are being made? Uh, how, how at, do you get well, results? Yeah. There, there, there is there's a, a lot of decision-making mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, focused on individuals. Yes. Like this, yes. Um, that's a great question. I think what, what would uh, be wonderful is if... Um, 
one of the ideas, and I, and I don't know if this will answer your question, but to me, if for in in these kinds of situations and settings, if if from the onset we had um, maybe three you know, grand challenges or, or five grand challenges that everybody coming to the forum was aware of and used the, you, we, we, we banked, we tapped into this brain trust to come up with solutions for these five grand challenges. And then I think that's something that has some solid takeaway from these, from these kinds of forums. And that also can engage, uh, include to engage the, uh, the younger generation as well. Uh, and whether that could also mean not only looking at solutions and brain trust, but um, yeah. Getting the the vote of the younger generation to push uh, the forum, for example, and you're talking about traveling and, and uh, emissions and water bottles and, and things like that, and doing an audit of of uh, these types of events um, to to happen, so that we can continue to make change. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so at the Global Shapers uh, community, I think we also have an advisory council and also a steering committee, depending on which projects that you're championing. So there's a lot of engagement with WAP as well, like on, on that end. Um, the second question like, was with, with regards to how can a media personality like yourself like, influence a layperson to think in a scientific or, or holistic uh, uh, manner? Yeah, I, I always do. I mean, I, I, I really, tr myself personally, this is my own, only my own experience, yeah. but I, I do really encourage people to read and listen to podcasts and science and all of this kind of stuff because it, you can't, um, I feel like you can't come to a very far, solid and fast kind of set of ethics and ways to live your life by it, unless you've really studied and kind of debated and used logic and reasoning to be able to sort of understand your position and your position in the world and also the effects on, on the environment. So that is something that I, I do really highly encourage. Um, and I, I think it's critical that anyone who does have a platform and wants to talk about these things also arms themselves with as much knowledge as possible from various different sources. Yeah. And, and the third question was with regards to hypocrisy. Like, so you see a lot of people doing small things like yeah. uh, you know, banning plastic straws, but then at the same time, you, know, like you have water bottles that are being used. Like, how do you shift that, that sort of mindset, I suppose? Like, <laughs> Tough questions. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't have the answers for that, but I do think, I do think that um, any small steps are good steps. And you know, of course, the, the, there's the whole, there's the whole thing about greenwashing and things like that. But I do think that if, if somebody or a corporation does start making taking small initiatives, that we shouldn't crucify them. Uh, and of course, what we we can do is we can encourage them and give them the tools to be able to do better. Uh, because sometimes what happens in corporations or in organizations when they do start to make uh, small or incremental changes, uh, people will attack them and saying, hey, you know, you're not doing enough or you're not, and then they pull back. They decide, well, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're getting flack for doing this. Maybe we, we won't do it at all. So um, maybe the best way is to support people in, in being able to make changes. Um, yep. I, I don't know, just yeah. an idea. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we might have time for just one more question. Uh, sorry, I think yeah, that lady at the back. Yeah, have put up her hand first. So. So. Good afternoon. I'm Vanshika, um, a global shaper from the New Delhi hub, India. Um, so I wanted to ask you that in this entire discourse of eco activism, um, you know, we know there are movements uh, like the Earth Hour and so on, which are global movements, and rightfully so. But for somebody coming from the global south, especially a developing emerging market like India, I mean, still urban Indians can resonate with a movement like that. But for most Indians living in rural India where people don't even have access to electricity, the argument is, um, okay, how do we kind of you know, integrate them in this process? One is um, uh, because something like an Earth caters to a particular type of demography, right? So people who are living in, de you know, demographies and geographies which anyway are backward, how do we celebrate their practices which can be, so I guess my question is, how do we kind of um, also take a bottom-up approach to integrate some of the local practices? Um, and from your, your experience as, as a UN, um, you know, goodwill ambassador, have you come across some very interesting um, experiences of, of local communities? So the question is, how do we engage from bottom up 
and have I experienced any local initiatives that have been uh, successful? Uh, India, India is, is very complex. India will be one of, it will be the worst affected by climate change. Uh, and uh, the farmers in India are having a very difficult time. And, uh, and it's interesting to note that on days when there are hotter days in India, the rate of suicide increases dramatically, actually. Uh, so India is, is a real a, a place that, we, that needs a lot of attention. Um, I don't have any... Um, I, I don't know if I have an answer for you on that. Um, but I do know that ground-up initiatives are very, very important. Uh, in conservation specifically, um, and my, my passion, maybe I haven't shared, but my passion actually is, is with elephants. Um, and I, I created a campaign to reduce the demand for ivory with the Asian consumers, uh, and it was yeah. focusing on demand side. Yeah. But what, was, what I learned through this process was that the organizations that had the most success with their conservation work uh, were the organizations that focused on community work. Yeah. Uh, and so investing in community, in community programs, uh, scholarships, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, uh, ranger conversion programs, uh, and things like this equals good conservation outcomes. Yeah. So uh, I think there's yeah. huge value, huge value in community-run yeah. uh, programs. Great, great. So I'm afraid we have come to the end of the session. Wait, thank you very much for the questions. Um, in 15 minutes time, there will be a director's cut, cut of um, Our Planet, which will be the, the first, very first time in, in China. So do stay back for that if you're interested. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you.